Welcome to Stuff You Missed in History Class, a production of iHeartRadio. Hello and welcome to the podcast. I'm Tracy V. Wilson. And I'm Holly Fry. This is part two of our unearthed, uh, covering things that have been literally and figuratively unearthed in the last quarter of 2021. So in this installment of Unearthed, we were gonna we're gonna have some necropolises. There were just a lot of those for some reason. Uh, some art and some edibles and potables and shipwrecks and of course the potpourri, which is where I put the interesting things that I thought were all really interesting, but I didn't have a good way to categorize them thematically. <laughs> uh, before we have the potpourri, though, we have another category that's a lot like potpourri in that it's random and it is last minute additions because. When I planned out when we were doing this, I did not realize that January 3rd was a company holiday, and that was the day that I was going to look through everything that happened over the holidays and, like, carefully weave it in to what was already written for the episode. So, no, I did not work yesterday and instead came up with this new category this morning at 8 a.m. I love it. Uh, A fundraising effort by the UK Friends of the National Library has successfully prevented a collection of manuscripts, documents, and some of the Bronte siblings' tiny books from being split up and sold at auction. These items had been collected in the 19th century by William Law and his brother Alfred. In addition to some of the Bronte's tiny books, which have been the subject of most of the headlines about this, the collection also includes works by Jane Austen, Robert Burns, and Sir Walter Scott. Sir Leonard Blavatnik matched donations to buy this collection, essentially contributing half the money for it. The total purchase price was more than 15 million pounds, and items from this collection are going to be donated to relevant museums, including the Bronte Parsonage Museum, Jane Austen's House, and the National Library of Scotland, among others. It's a really amazing collection, I'm very glad they were able to to buy it and put it in museums instead of having it sort of dissipate to other collectors. And if this all sounds a bit familiar, especially the part about the Bronte's tiny books, we covered a similar fundraising effort in our first quarter unearthed for 2020. And in my next last-minute edition, conservators in Virginia have found two different cornerstone boxes in the pedestal of a statue of Robert E. Lee, The statue part was removed from the site in September. The contents of these two boxes are yet to be thoroughly analyzed, but they're pretty typical of time capsules, although there was no specified date for opening either of these two. There are things like newspapers and other documents and books and coins and memorabilia, including some bullets. At the same time, uh, even though these are pretty typical things that we find in these sorts of boxes, there are some mysteries One of the boxes was placed on October 27, 1887, and news accounts from the time reference some items that have not been found in either box, one of them being a photo of Abraham Lincoln in his coffin. There is an illustration of Abraham Lincoln from one of them, but this photo has not been found. And in our last last last-minute edition, according to research by the Missing Princes Project spearheaded by Philippa Langley, Edward V might not have died in the Tower of London. Instead, Richard III may have sent him to the village of Coldridge in Devon in secret, where he lived under the name John Evans. The evidence submitted to back this up sounds a little like a conspiracy theory. Uh, A lot of articles about this have referenced the Da Vinci Code, John Evans was new to the area. Nobody had ever heard of him, but in spite of that, he was given the title Lord of the Manor and also oversaw the area's deer park. He also commissioned artwork for a local church, including a stained glass window depicting Edward V. It's one of the very few such depictions of Edward V, and it was placed over the location where Evans wanted his tomb to be placed. That tomb is engraved with the name John Evas rather than Evans, and it's empty. But the team has speculated that this misspelling is intentional, with the EV standing for Edward V and the AS possibly standing for a Latin term meaning in sanctuary. Uh, 
it it seems like the kind of thing you might illustrate with a murder board. <laughs> so that was our last last minute edition, and now we'll move on to the potpourri stuff that I wrote before taking off for the holidays. Four boomerangs were discovered in a creek bed during a drought in Australia in 2017 and 2018. The Yandrawanda Yawarawaka Traditional Landowners, an Aboriginal corporation, partnered with Australian Heritage Services, Flinders University, and the Australian Nuclear Science and Technology Organization to learn more about them. Radiocarbon dating revealed that they were made between 1650 and 1830 before Europeans first entered the area. These are non-returning boomerangs, and they were likely used for digging and for fire management in addition to hunting and fighting, and they may have had a religious use as well. Researchers re-examining Soviet-era archaeological research have determined that a lyre found in southwest Kazakhstan is incredibly similar to one known as the Sutton Hu Lyre, named after the Sutton Hu ship burial where it was found. These two sites are 4,000 kilometers apart, and before this point, Sutton Hoo-style lyres had not been found outside of Western Europe. This suggests that this style of lyre may have been part of a more wide-ranging musical tradition in the early medieval period, rather than something that was specific to Western Europe. Moving on, two 6th century graves excavated in Bavaria have included a couple of unique finds. One of the graves belonged to somebody who was between 40 and 50 years old when he died, and it included lots of weapons, including a battle axe, a sword, a lance, and a shield. There was also a bridle and a pair of spurs, which may have been used with a horse that was also buried nearby. And there was a bag buried at the man's feet, which had mostly decomposed, but it seems to have basically been a toiletries bag. Its contents included a pair of scissors and a shattered ivory comb. Once that comb had been pieced back together, it was shown to be decorated on both sides with hunting scenes. Combs aren't uncommon as grave goods from this period, but they're more likely to be made of something like wood, bone, or antler than ivory. And then on top of that, there are antelope-like animals shown in these hunting scenes that are not native to the region of Europe where the grave was found. The other grave seems to have belonged to a woman between the ages of 30 and 40 years old, and the goods buried with her included jewelry, food, and a weaving tool. But there was also a bowl, and like the comb in the other grave, a bowl that doesn't seem to have been local to the area. It's a style known as African red slipwear. This kind of pottery was carried through much of the Roman Empire, but was made in Tunisia, and this is the first complete bowl found in Germany. So this has raised some questions. Did these two people travel and bring these pieces back with them? Were they gifts from far away? It's kind of a mystery. Archaeologists in Norway have found a 1,300-year-old ski, believed to be the mate of one that was found about five meters away in 2014. Both of these skis are wood, with bindings made from birch ropes and leather straps. If indeed they are a pair, and not skis from two different pairs that were coincidentally close together, then they are the best-preserved pair of prehistoric skis found to date. Although researchers believe that these two skis were a set, they're not actually identical. It's possible that whoever was using them made a new pair out of two different skis, They also show evidence of a lot of repair, suggesting that these skis were just too valuable to try to replace if they were damaged. In our next item, it has long been established that the Norse arrived in North America long before Columbus's 1492 voyage, including building a settlement in what's now Newfoundland. But it hasn't been clear when exactly that happened. According to research published in the journal Nature, it was in the year 1021, making the earliest known crossing of the Atlantic Ocean something that happened a thousand years ago. This research involved three pieces of wood, all of which showed evidence of being cut with metal tools, and at the time, the indigenous population of North America did not have these sorts of metal tools. The wood still had a rough edge from where it was cut, and that's something that would have been worn away if it had been brought a long distance across the ocean. So that led researchers to conclude that this had been cut down in North America. It was not something that had been cut down elsewhere and then brought to North America. 
The wood came from three different trees, and the dating relied on a massive solar storm that happened in the year 992. Researchers can see evidence of this solar storm in tree rings, and each of the three pieces of wood had 29 growth rings after that solar storm. So the Norse came to North America with metal tools in 1021, cutting down these three trees after they arrived. Next up, archaeologists in Utah have been excavating the site of a town that housed Chinese workers during the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. The town, known as Terrace, was a temporary home to about 500 people as the railroad was being built, and then it was abandoned once that stretch of the railroad was complete. At least some of the buildings later burned down. In addition to finding the remains of a building that had housed some of the workers, archaeologists have found a medicine bottle, porcelain bowls, writing instruments, and a 17th century Chinese coin. Next up, researchers in Pompeii have concluded that a recently unearthed room was the living quarters for enslaved people, possibly an enslaved family. The room is part of a much larger villa, but it measures only about 16 square meters, or 170 square feet, and it seems to have functioned as a sleeping and living space and as storage. The stored items included what appear to be parts of chariot harnesses, and the room adjoins a space where the remains of horses and a stable had been unearthed earlier in the year. One of the three beds in the room is smaller than the other, so it was possibly meant to be used by a child. And in our last bit of potpourri, a team excavating a tomb in China's Ningxia region believe they had found the body of a grave robber, since this body was found in a tunnel that had been dug by looters. But examination of the remains has revealed that he was probably a murder victim with this murder unrelated to the looting who had been dumped into the shaft later and left to die. The shaft was dug sometime between the years 25 and 220 CE, but the remains date back only to the year 640. And the shaft had also started to fill up with soil again by the time this person died. Apart from all of that, the skeleton shows signs of having been repeatedly stabbed. This research was published in the journal Archaeological and Anthropological Sciences under the delightful title, Hiding a Leaf in the Forest, Uncovering a 1,300-Year-Old Homicide Case in a 2,000-Year-Old Cemetery. Next up, we have a few necropolises in this installment of Unearthed. First, archaeologists have known about a rock-cut tomb complex in what's now Turkey for more than 150 years, but it's really been more recently that there has been a thorough examination of this area. This site is part of an ancient city known as Blondos, which was founded during the time of Alexander the Great, and that makes these tombs about 1,800 years old. This excavation project started in 2018, and researchers have been stunned at just how huge this necropolis is. They have found more than 400 rock-cut tombs believed to have been used as family burial chambers over multiple generations. Many of these are heavily decorated, although these adornments have deteriorated over the years, and so far, only 24 murals are still visible. Unfortunately, many of the tombs are easily seen from the surface since they're cut into a cliff face, and as a consequence, they have been looted or otherwise damaged over the previous centuries. In the same complex, they've also found temples, a theater, a public bath, and more. And there are believed to be hundreds more burial sites that haven't been explored yet. And analysis of those sites has, of course, not been done yet. Next up, archaeologists in Pulley near Lake Geneva have found new tombs in a necropolis there during monitoring work ahead of construction. This site was first excavated in the early 20th century and is home to the oldest Neolithic burials in Switzerland. These newly discovered burial sites were fairly close to the surface and they are in poor condition, with many of the slabs that cover the remains already broken into pieces. The grave sites that were threatened by the construction were rescued, but the ones outside of that area were covered and preserved. And lastly, a late Roman necropolis has been found under the wall of a grocery store in Arras, northern France. This was first detected in 2020 and excavated this past fall. Most of the burials in this necropolis are individual bodies in wood coffins that have been placed in cut graves, really without a lot of grave goods. 
Uh, and now we're going to take a quick sponsor break before we talk about some art. We have a lot of stuff related to art this time around. Conservators have found a previously unknown painting by Armenian-American artist Arshil Gorky under his painting The Limit, which he completed in 1947. Gorky's daughter had long suspected that there was another work of art underneath the limit, but conservators have thought it was just too risky to try to reveal it. Swiss conservators Michaela Ritter and Olivier Masson finally began working with this piece during the pandemic, carefully removing the limit, which is a work on paper, from the canvas underneath. And it turned out that, yes, that underlying canvas did have its own painting, one now known as Untitled, with the parenthesis Virginia Summer, which was most likely painted earlier in 1947. It's possible that the artist meant for this layering of the two artworks to be temporary, sort of using that canvas temporarily and was going to remove the paper painting, but he died in 1948. In a September find that didn't cross our radar until now, Johannes Vermeer's Girl Reading a Letter at an Open Window has been restored, revealing a depiction of Cupid. Scholars have known Cupid was there for about 40 years since it was visible in an x-ray of the piece, but they thought Vermeer had removed the depiction of Cupid himself while working on the painting. But during this painting's restoration, the area where Cupid was known to be did not react to solvents the same way that the rest of the painting did. This suggested that the paint used to cover up Cupid was a different type than had been used when painting the rest of the work, possibly put there by someone else who tried to make that cover-up blend in with the original. I mean, it worked for a while. It did work. (laughs) The museum convened a panel of Vermeer experts who decided that the best course of action was to collect microscopic samples from the painting to study them, confirming that the paint covering the cupid had been applied years or even decades after the rest of the work was complete. With the experts okay, conservators removed the rectangle of painting that had been added later. The depiction of Cupid is a painting within a painting, and that same Cupid is also used in other Vermeer artworks, including Young Woman Standing at a Virginal and Girl Interrupted at Her Music. This discovery has also raised some speculations about other artworks in which a subject is in front of a seemingly blank wall, and whether that blank wall also has a covered-over depiction of Cupid. Moving on, curators at Norway's National Museum were using infrared reflectography to examine Edvard Munch's 1894 Madonna as part of a routine conservation checkup. They discovered that earlier sketches are still visible using this non-invasive technique, and these sketches suggest that earlier drafts of the painting were more conservative. In the final painting, a nude woman has one of her arms stretched up above her head, and the other sort of tucked behind her lower back in a pose that definitely looks sensuous. But in the earlier sketch, that stretched up arm is down along her side, and it's a position that looks more restful than erotic. In similar news, Rijksmuseum has announced the discovery of preparatory sketches in Rembrandt's 1642 painting, The Night Watch, which are visible through macro XRF imaging. This discovery came during a two-year restoration project for that piece. And speaking of Rembrandt, scientists in the Netherlands have figured out that they can determine exactly when paintings from the Dutch Golden Age were created based on the exact composition of their lead-white pigments. This is because conflicts like the English Civil Wars and the Eighty Years' War disrupted lead supplies, forcing artists to adjust the amount of lead they were using in their paints. Archaeologists working on the high-speed rail project, known as HS2, have unearthed three Roman-era busts while excavating a Norman church in Stoke Mandeville. They had expected to find early English artifacts because the excavation site was home to a medieval tower, but instead found these three much older stone sculptures. Two had essentially been decapitated, with the head and the torso both still present, and the third was only the head. In addition to these three very well-preserved statues, they also found a hexagonal glass jug with large pieces of the glass still intact. 
Based on all of this, they believe this tower was built directly on top of the site of what had been a Roman mausoleum, and which had other uses prior to that. And in similar news, excavations in western Turkey have unearthed the heads of statues depicting Aphrodite and Dionysus. Moving on, a sculpture spotted outside a home in St. Louis in 2019 has been confirmed as Martha and Mary by the late artist William Edmondson, who died in 1951. This sculpture had also been displayed at the Museum of Modern Art in 1937. That was a solo exhibition, making Edmondson the first Black artist to have a solo show at MoMA. It appears that Anthony A. Bliss, executive director of the Metropolitan Opera, acquired the statue sometime after that show, and then his wife Sally inherited it after he died. Street artist Brian Donnelly, known as Cause, purchased this from Bliss as a gift for the American Folk Art Museum. The statue has since been cleaned, and it will be on display at the museum in early 2022. Next up, restorers working at Calverley Old Hall in Yorkshire, England, have found floor-to-ceiling Tudor-era paintings under some 19th-century plaster. These paintings basically serve the purpose of wallpaper and depict exaggerated vines and mythical animals. They seem to be based on designs from the Golden House of Roman Emperor Nero. It's possible that a 19th century owner of this manor covered the paintings up with plaster to try to protect them, so now conservators are at work figuring out the best way to preserve them. Next up, a walk around family land in Rutland has led to the discovery of a mosaic depicting scenes from Homer's The Iliad, which was part of a Roman-era villa complex. The complex seems to have been built sometime between the 3rd and 4th century. This is the first mosaic in Britain that depicts the Iliad, and it's being investigated by the University of Leicester in partnership with Historic England and Rutland City Council. And in another accidental family find, members of the Sitwell family have decided to auction off the family's artwork and other objects from Weston Hall in Northamptonshire, England. And as all these items were being collected and cataloged, they found a forgotten work of art just wrapped up in bubble wrap. It turned out to be a drawing by Italian painter Giovanni Battista Tiepolo, who worked in the 18th century. This is called A Large Group of Punchinelli. Punchinelli were buffoonish stock characters from 17th century Commedia dell'arte. And in this depiction, they are all eating gnocchi, which I just find delightful. So good. Osbert Sitwell bought this painting in 1936, and then uh, they just forgot about it. Uh, This was sold at auction in November with a final bid of 100,000 pounds. I think more paintings should feature large groups of people just happily eating. Just eating, just munching on stuff. Uh, Now it's time for swords, glorious swords. Uh, A diver off the coast of Israel has found a 900-year-old sword on the seafloor, along with other artifacts from about the same period. The sword itself is believed to be in excellent condition, although it is completely encrusted in marine life, so it is not entirely clear exactly what's under there. Based on where it was found, it may be a crusader sword. It was in an area where ships took shelter. The seafloor in this area is constantly shifting and revealing new finds. So this diver, Shlomi Katzen, was afraid that the sword would be buried again if it was just left there, and so took it to the surface and reported it to authorities. That is how we have lots of photographs of this absolutely marine life-encrusted sword. That's actually how it's designed. It's not. (laughs) That would be amazing. Uh, Another sword, a broken Bronze Age sword, has been found in southwestern Finland. This is a rare find. Only about 200 Bronze Age items have been found in Finland, and swords and knives are only a little more than 10% of those. The fragments were found in July by someone who was using a newly purchased metal detector to check out his childhood home, but the find wasn't announced until October. Although this was found under the lawn of a family home, it is not clear how the broken sword got there. It's possible that it was in soil that was brought in for construction years ago. He contacted Finland's National Board of Antiquities after finding the first couple of clearly very old sword pieces, and a more official excavation uncovered the rest. Next up, we have a couple of finds related to animals. According to research published in the journal Nature in October, 
an interdisciplinary team of researchers has concluded that today's horses were first domesticated in the Pontic Caspian steppes in the Northern Caucasus. This happened somewhere around 2200 BCE. And then over the next few centuries, these domesticated horses replaced genetically distinct wild horses in Anatolia, Europe, and Central Asia and Siberia. This research involved genetic analysis of 273 horse specimens that lived from 50,000 to a little more than 2,000 years ago. They analyzed their genes and then compared the results to modern domesticated horses living today. However, these were not the first horses ever to be domesticated. That was in Bataille, Central Asia, around 3500 BCE. But those earlier horses aren't the ancestors of today's domestic horses. Their descendants are a feral Mongolian horse known as Zorowski's horse. Our next animal find. Researchers in Seville have tried to confirm Neanderthal hunting techniques for a crow-like bird called the chuff. It seems very likely that the Neanderthals used chuffs as a food source. There have been various finds of chuff bones that have tooth marks in caves that show evidence of Neanderthal use. But it also seems like this would be a tricky animal for Neanderthals to hunt. Thinking that Neanderthals might have used nets and torches, researchers armed themselves with butterfly nets and flashlights and went into caves and other dark spaces where modern chuffs are known to roost at night. And they found that the chuffs became confused when the researchers shined flashlights at them. They wound up just flying into dead-end spaces where it was easy for people to just scoop them right up. Is this how Neanderthals did it? Who knows? But it does suggest one possible way. I also just, you know, I don't want to be cruel to animals, but I find this scenario kind of amusing. Uh, If this is a Neanderthal technique for hunting, it confirms... Once again, as with many, many other things we've talked about on Earth, that they were pretty good at problem-solving and stuff. I feel like almost every time I'm researching these episodes, I find headlines that make it sound like this is new information. (laughs) Uh, Moving on, archaeologists in the Haida Gwaii archipelago off the northern coast of British Columbia have found the tooth of a domesticated dog. It was confirmed to be a dog tooth through its DNA, and radiocarbon dating suggests that it lived 13,100 years ago. This is the oldest evidence of domestic dogs discovered so far in the Americas, and it also suggests that people were living on the archipelago about 2,000 years earlier than previously thought. The Haida Nation's oral histories were also part of this work, and indigenous archaeologists who were part of this work have described it as the field of archaeology catching up to those oral histories. And lastly, archaeologists have studied fish bones at four sites connected to the Tsleil-Waututh First Nations community on what's now the west coast of Canada. Researchers have concluded that for about a thousand years, the Tsleil-Waututh were using large weirs to catch salmon, determining the salmon's sex, and releasing most of the females. Bones found at village sites were overwhelmingly those of male fish. European colonists ultimately destroyed these indigenous fishing tools, and since then, the salmon population in this area has largely collapsed. Jesse Morin, archaeologist for the Tsleil-Waututh Nation and an adjunct professor at the University of British Columbia, was quoted in the Canadian press as saying, quote, People were harvesting the same sort of fish consistently, probably from the same places, for 1,000 years. Here we are, 150 years later, 150 years worth of industrial harvesting, and we've really destroyed these resources. After we take a quick sponsor break, we will move on to some edibles and potables, some of which uh, were also animal-related. There's a little overlap in those two categories. Now we are moving on to one of our favorite topics, which is the edibles and potables. According to research published in the journal Current Biology on October 13th, Workers at prehistoric salt mines in Austria drank beer and ate blue cheese. Researchers came to this conclusion after analyzing paleo feces in the mines, which has been preserved for about 2,700 years thanks to the conditions in the mine. 
This is the earliest evidence found so far of both beer drinking and blue cheese eating in Europe. In the words of Kirsten Kowarik of the Museum of Natural History Vienna, quote, it is becoming increasingly clear that not only were prehistoric culinary practices sophisticated, but also that complex processed foodstuffs, as well as the technique of fermentation, have held a prominent role in our early food history. Next up, researchers at a site known as Jordan River Durijat have found evidence that people were using complex fishing tools and techniques as long as 12,000 years ago. Excavations have unearthed 19 bone hooks and grooved pebbles that seem to have been used as sinkers. It can be tricky to study fishing technology because things like lines and nets are usually made from fibers that decompose, but there are fiber residues on these hooks that suggest that they were used with lines of some sort. There's also some variation in the shapes of the hooks, including their barbs and how they were connected to a line, suggesting that people were using different hooks to catch different types of fish. There's also some suggestion that these hooks were used along with artificial lures. We already knew that people living in this area 12,000 years ago were eating fish, but this is the earliest evidence of their using things like hooks and artificial lures to catch them. Archaeologists in Iraq have found a commercial winery, including stone-cut basins dating back to the 8th or 7th century BCE, as well as 14 stone-cut installations that were used for pressing the juice. The winery is near an area where archaeologists have been examining stone-cut reliefs carved into irrigation canals. The reliefs depict sacred animals and kings in prayer, probably commissioned by the same kings who paid for the canals to be built as both a symbol of religious devotion and a reminder of who had funded the irrigation project. And archaeologists have also found a massive early medieval wine factory in Israel. This was another facility that was used to make wine on a large commercial scale. This one has five wine presses, four large warehouses for storing and aging the wine, and facilities for making and firing the amphorate that were used to store the wine. There are also large vats and a treading floor where the grapes were crushed underfoot. A spokesperson from the Israeli Antiquities Authority estimated that this winery could have produced 2 million liters of wine per year. A gold and amethyst ring has also been found not far from this site. It dates back to at least the 7th century, and there's some speculation that it may have been worn for hangover prevention. The amethyst has traditionally been regarded as having anti-hangover properties. Moving on, archaeologists in Germany have found a 79-year-old badly charred cake in the town of Lübeck. The British Royal Air Force bombed this town on March 28th of 1942, and the freshly unwrapped cake was buried and burned as the building's upper floors collapsed over it and caught fire. Even though this cake is badly burned, its nutty filling was preserved pretty well in this fire. This is planned to be uh, conserved and eventually put on public display. And lastly, in Edibles and Potables, Polish archaeologists have found a unique kitchenware set at the site of a Roman legionary camp in Bulgaria. These pieces were made of very high-quality clay, and they seem to represent a full array of pots, lids, bowls, and cups, as well as glasses that look like today's pine glasses. The team plans to conserve and analyze this cookware set to determine what was cooked and stored in the vessels. It is likely that at least some of it was seafood, since there were also oyster shells found nearby. And now we're going to move on to another favorite category, which is shipwrecks. Volcanic and tectonic activity near the Ogasawara Island chain in Japan has lifted the seafloor around the island of Iyoto, known in English as Iwo Jima, revealing a fleet of World War II-era ships. These are Japanese ships that American forces sank after the Battle of Iwo Jima, hoping that the wreckage would form a breakwater to help create a harbor. That did not work. But in photos of this, you can see that the ships are arranged in a way that was purposeful. Next up, the U.S. revenue cutter Bear sank during a storm in 1963. It had been decommissioned and tied to a wharf in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and it was in the process of being towed to Philadelphia. 
But before that point, it had a long history at sea. It started out as a vessel for seal hunting in 1874. The U.S. government bought it a few years later to use for rescue work since it had been built to be able to navigate icy waters. Its work as a relief vessel included being part of the rescue fleet of the Greeley Expedition in 1881. It operated as a relief ship during the 1918 flu pandemic and was finally decommissioned in 1929. For a time after that, it was used as a floating museum in Oakland, California, and then as a film set. Then the bear was recommissioned during World War II and sent back to the Arctic to patrol. During that time, it helped capture a Norwegian ship that the German military was using to gather and report information about weather conditions in the North Atlantic. Various people and groups have been searching for the wreck of the bear since the 1970s. In 2019, sonar mapping of a 62 square mile, that's about 160 square kilometers, area of seafloor revealed two sunken ships. In September of this year, investigators returned to the area with a remote operated vehicle and identified one of those ships as the bear. We also have a couple of canoes. A maritime archaeologist from the Wisconsin Historical Society spotted what she thought was a log in Lake Mendota in Wisconsin, but it turned out to be the oldest intact boat ever found in the state. It's believed to be about 1,200 years old and was probably made by the Effigy Mound Builders, who are the ancestors of today's Ho-Chunk Nation, It is so well-preserved that the archaeologists initially thought this was a Boy Scout project from the 1950s. Archaeologists decided to raise the canoe from the floor of the lake since it was likely to be destroyed by microorganisms if it was left where it was. It is currently undergoing a preservation process with the hope that it can be put on public display. Ho-Chunk Tribal Historic Preservation Officer Bill Quackenbush told reporters that he would collaborate with the Wisconsin Historical Society on the canoe's preservation. The other canoe was found in a cenote, or a freshwater sinkhole, in southern Mexico. It's believed to be about a thousand years old, and it's the first complete canoe of its type ever found. It's possible that the Maya used this canoe to gather water or to make offerings in the cenote. This is one of many, many objects that have been unearthed during work on a railway that's being built to connect multiple sites across the Yucatan Peninsula. This is a controversial project. It's meant to bring tourists from the beaches on the coast to historic and cultural sites and smaller towns farther inland. But there are a lot of archaeological sites along the path of the train, with more being discovered as work goes on. Archaeologists working ahead of the train construction have found hundreds of sites encompassing thousands of structures. The potential archaeological and environmental impacts of the train project have both drawn a lot of criticism. And now we have a random final thing for the end of this episode. So for our last find of 2021, it's actually something that was first found in 2013. A glacier climber stumbled onto a box from an Air India passenger jet that had crashed on January 24th, 1966. This plane was one of two planes that crashed into Mont Blanc in the middle of the 20th century. And climbers in the area often find various things from each of them. In this case, this box turned out to contain emeralds and sapphires. This climber turned the box into authorities who tried to track down the survivors of whoever this box had belonged to. That effort was unsuccessful, and in December, it was announced that the climber would get to keep half of the gemstones. The other half is going to the village of Chamonix, near the crash site, where they will become part of the collection of the Chamonix Crystals Museum. According to news coverage, the climber, who has not been named, will be selling off his half and using some of the money to renovate his apartment. And that's our unearthed concluding year of 2021. So many things were unearthed. So many. And that means so many things that we didn't even talk about in the episode. (laughs) Uh, I have a listener mail from Ava to take us out. And Ava wrote, Dear Holly and Tracy, I've been listening to the podcast for a while now, but have never felt so compelled to write into any show as I did when I listened to the Nutcracker episode. 
I hold a Doctor of Musical Arts degree in violin performance, and while it is true that each winter we are all one more nutcracker closer to death, the nutcracker is one of the big influences in why I have chosen the career path I have and hold the degrees that I do. As a child, attending the Houston Ballet's production of The Nutcracker was a holiday tradition for my family, and I even danced as a tiny apricot in the background of the Sugar Plum Fairy sequence in my ballet school's production one year when I was young. Although I went to school for music, I didn't know until listening to the episode why The Nutcracker is such a Christmas mainstay in our culture. Disney's Fantasia also played a huge part in creating my musical path in life, It is partly because of the Nutcracker and Rite of Spring sequences in that movie that I eventually ended up begging my parents for violin lessons. I would even love to hear a future episode on Stravinsky's Rite of Spring, as it has an amazingly interesting dance, musical, and social history behind it, much like Tchaikovsky's Nutcracker. Thank you for providing a well-researched and insightful approach to topics that we sometimes take for granted or overlook completely. As a small thank you, I've attached pictures of my kitties, Socks, Tuxedo Cat, Pip, Torty, and Coco, Gray Tabby. Thanks again, Ava. Thank you for this email, Ava. It really warmed my heart. <laughs> we mentioned people uh, really being influenced by the Nutcracker and uh, and the, the and Disney's Fantasia, but hearing from someone directly who turned that into a career path really warmed my heart. Also, it's been a long time since I listened to this episode, and I don't remember how much it gets into the greater history of the Rite of Spring, but previous hosts Sarah and Dublina did an episode on the Rite of Spring riot back on June 29th of 2011. Uh, I can't remember if we've ever done a Saturday classic with that, but if not, maybe we will at some point. So thank you again, Ava, for this email and for the cat pictures. They're adorable. If you would like to send us an email, we're at historypodcast at iheartradio.com and we're all over social media at Mist in History. That's where you'll find our Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram. And you can subscribe to our show on the iHeartRadio app and anywhere else you get your podcasts. Stuff You Missed in History Class is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.